It's not the money or lack thereof. It's not how hard the experiments have to do. It's not the hours you could have pulled to get the breakthrough. The hardest part about science is nobody cares. Thoughts expressed in this podcast on my own did not reflect the values of my employers. Welcome back to the Biolab Collective with Jack Wayne Podcast. My name is Jack. I'm a scientist, YouTuber, and podcaster. And on this podcast, we talk about the business of science and how the latest headlines in science and tech informs us about the jobs of the future. And today's topic is something I've been thinking about quite a lot, which is tied in very closely to how hard it's been launching a YouTube channel and a podcast revolving around science. Because the hardest thing about science is that fundamentally, nobody cares. Of course, some people care, but we are in the minority. And to make people care is the hardest part of the job. And this trend really struck me when I was looking at the science headline roundup in 2023, trying to see if there's any patterns or trends emerging from what people supposedly care the most about with science. This article from The Guardian tries to round out the 10 biggest science stories of 2023 as shown by scientists. And if we go through the headlines very quickly, India's lunar lander reaches the dark side of the moon. AI is finally starting to feel like AI. Girls doing hard maths, figuring out a new mathematical proof of the Pythagorean theorem. Insights around the early migration out of Africa, as well as the hottest year on record. There's a new CRISPR theory for sickle cell disease and beta thalassemia, as well as having Wigovi or Ozempic and superconductor with respect to a breakthrough in room temperature superconductor technology and pesticides and herbicides, not to mention stem cell based embryo models. I'm a science teacher and the most important part of designing any science class is showing how concepts connect to another and also scaffolding information so that one piece of information makes sense next to another one. And if you look across all of those headlines, none of them have anything to do with each other other than they are science. And this is very fragmented for someone who doesn't know about science to be able to deep dive and make sense of what the world of science is trying to do to drive breakthrough and innovation. And it is a very difficult communication challenge. Ultimately, what you want to do in communication is to bridge each piece of information with another piece of interconnected information. And this kind of approach to communicating science drives me crazy. The hardest part about science is that it is very difficult to get people to care and every headline is different from the other. If we take a more recent scan of the latest science headlines from New York Times, again, let's try and take that analytical approach. What is the connective tissue between these headlines? A fern's zombie frond sprouts unusual roots. A moon lander is lying on its side but still functional. Dirty ice may be ugly, but it has one advantage. So there are a lot of space-based headlines, which is great if you're into space exploration. There's a lot of headlines around nature, poisonous frogs, mysterious patterns and caves, mushrooms growing in a strange place. What we know about Zolair and food allergies, what it's like to be a sociopath, psychology. Again, these are super fragmented domains. An expert in one of these will have nothing of value to contribute in another domain that's placed very neatly alongside the other science headline on the front page of New York Times. When we think about the far reaching impact of how science is presented in headlines, most people I know don't care about science. They think it's boring, but it's not boring. You just have to find the area of science that really interests you and really excites you intellectually, but it is very difficult to find that taking a scan of some of the biggest publications online and in the world, because it is a very fragmented approach to science. And if you think, well, it's the fault of the teachers, the science teachers are doing a good job. I know quite a few science teachers within the Australian system. And unfortunately, due to whatever perceptions around science being boring or the lack of systemic funding, the science teachers in general have difficulty climbing up the ranks. People who teach the disciplines where public speaking and the ability to win arguments, the English department, the drama department, the humanities, in our system in Australia, they tend to be rewarded and those are the kind of people who then go on to become principals or deputy principals because their skill set is involved in communication and communication with parents and students is ultimately what teaching is about, certainly in the earlier years of education. So for science teachers, they seem to, for a lot of different reasons, had difficulty climbing up the ranks and getting more visibility for the discipline that they're trying to teach. 
not to minimize the impact of the great work done by heads of departments and science schools all over the world, all over the country, but it's just a different game. It's a different hill to climb if fundamentally people find what you're working on, what you're talking about, just a little less interesting than the average topic. Yet it's so important to understand all of these things, so there is the rub. How do we fix this problem that science is simultaneously very important and way more interesting than anyone can possibly hope to know, while at the same time, on face value, very complex, very stodgy, very boring. I have a lot of young nieces and fundamentally I'm very sad that none of them are that excited by science. They go boo when it comes to science assignments and they're very excited when there's English and drama. So I think there is an image problem we need to overcome and as scientists, myself, all of you, and people who are scientifically minded or interested in science, we have a huge task carved out ahead of us. And my solution for this is to broaden the range of skills that we have. Science is already a very interdisciplinary field, and I argue we need to be even more broad in our approach to learning. This book by David Epstein, Range, Why Generalists Triumph in a Specialized World, has been resonating with me a lot, an awful lot. Of late. I think I count as a specialist and many of you listening to this are world experts in your respective domains but you take us outside of that domain and we are relatively powerless. We are relatively ineffectual in convincing the world that what we do is important. If you take a worldly expert and you put them in a parent-teacher conference, hey we're still there just trying to find out if our kids survived that week or that year. Our specialization is not translating consistently enough to make people care about the work that we do. And the thesis of this book, people who try and learn very broadly, very early on in life, when they then go on to specialize, they bring forth all of those other skills to that new specialized task. And they're much better at that task than people who've only ever focused on that one simple task. The examples they bring up based a lot in the world of sports, Tiger Woods, who specialized very early as a golfer, whereas Roger Federer, who came to focus on tennis much later on, they have different trajectories for dealing with life and dealing with problems in their life. We can take a lot out of the idea of range. Science is so difficult to get good at with any of these fields, any of those headlines we see on New York Times, all of those are specialties and subspecialties that take a lifetime to master, but can't lose sight of the importance of learning the other skills, the range of skills that you would need to make you a much more effective science communicator, which will in turn make people care more about science more broadly, and then your work may find more traction yet again. One of the ways that I've been approaching this range problem in my immediate context is I make a lot of multimedia. So I started a YouTube channel, Biolab Collective, which you may be watching or listening on as well as this podcast, but it has been a long slog because of the problem I just outlined. Science is something that people don't on face value know what to do with. And one of the first pieces of advice you hear about when you want to start a YouTube channel is you need to have a niche and you need to double down or niche down on that area of specialization so people know what you're about. A lot of really big science channels on YouTube SciShow, I think is probably one of the biggest ones. People who are trying to make content around science, Veritasium, of course, they have not niched down. They talk very broadly about all these different types of science. They take a scattered approach. They find the most interesting problem irrespective of discipline and talk about that because that is how science is presented. That's what people expect when it comes to the most interesting science ideas. They don't just want to hear about a bacteria every single day. So the niche of science is actually too general, but also too specific or at the same time. Do you see the problem that we're dealing with? I've seen that within the growth trajectory of my science online platforms. It's difficult to get people to care about different things, but also you could argue if you niche down too early, then if that thing you niche down on people aren't interested in, then you're stuck. Where is all of this going? Where is my solution to this problem? My solution to this problem is, we all need more teaching experience. Uh, it doesn't have to be teaching science, but it should be teaching something because teaching is the purest and most aggressive form of communication training you're going to get. Only stand-up comedian is more aggressive because you will get booed off stage if you're not good at entertaining the audience. As a teacher, you don't need to be entertaining 100% of the time, but you do need to be clear. And you will see when the look in the eyes of your students starts glazing over that that lack of clarity is very self-evident 
and empathizing with your students is the first part of understanding the communication problem when it comes to science. As part of our recurring series, Job Hunters, let's look now at some of the jobs in science education offered and advertised in Australia and see what we can learn from these different jobs that are being advertised. Right away, the first job that comes up is a role of science communicator at the Australian Age of Dinosaurs based in Western Queensland, leading a world-class museum of natural history and organizing dinosaur discoveries. I'm not a paleontologist, but dinosaurs are an area where people naturally have an affinity towards. People love dinosaurs, love the idea of prehistoric history. So this is a niche that you could go down and invest more in and play a pivotal role getting paid to talk about in fundamental area of science that people already have a baked in interest. But this is not a role that's that common. Science communication is still a field that is finding its footing and people who are professional science communicators usually do so on behalf of a big institution. For example, this is on behalf of a museum. There are science communicators who work for art galleries or they work for universities. There are not that many individual startup science communicators just talking about science in their own field, but that doesn't mean you can't be the first one to break that mold and that you won't be the first one to develop skills talking about your specific scientific topic. On top of that, there are teacher positions, high school teachers, primary school teachers, usually having to teach a combination of English and humanities or maths and science. And there are science teachers needed all across the world. Teaching science is a hard thing. So there's always a shortage of science teachers. Certainly, if you go out in more remote areas of my country, they are especially lacking for teachers who teach in math and science. These are technical and difficult disciplines to master. And if I can give you a recommendation as we look across teaching jobs, both entry level as well as head of departments, science masters, and contrast them against entry level jobs working in research, I would always recommend that you try and work as a researcher in science before you then branch into teaching because the communication skill sets, yes, they're very difficult to find, but you're going to be competing against people who are fluent in the humanities, fluent in English, where communications in their entire bread and butter. So if you go and compete against those applicants, you are focused on science, but your scientific training isn't yet fully mature. You may be focused on communication, but your communication training won't be as extensive as those who do English, humanities, psychology, drama. So you're not competing, you're not leading on either end of those talent pools. So then you need to more double down on the scientific skill set. And the best way of doing that is once you finish a college degree in teaching or science, you try and work in science for a few years, work in a research laboratory, work in a clinical testing environment, get some fundamental scientific bona fides under your belt. I know a lot of examples of people who work as postdoctoral research scientists then go and do a teaching qualification. They're not coming in at the entry level. They can rise to the ranks very quickly and become head of department, science master, because that scientific bona fides, their scientific CV, what they've done, the grants that they've applied for, the types of science projects they've worked on, the teams they've managed, those skill sets are more readily available to you via the science pathway than via the teaching pathway. And if you go just down the teaching pathway first, the skill sets you need, the range of skills, they're outside of the traditional scientific pathway in undergraduate university or undergraduate college training. That's something we're trying to fix. We're trying to imbue the undergraduate scientific training process with a bit more versatility, but there's only so much room in the curriculum. So again, my advice, if you want to become a science teacher and bridge that divide, making more people care about science, then you need to start working in science Maybe in the research environment, because a lot of the jobs are in research, you get that sense of innovation, you get that sense of how to move the ball forward. And then when you pivot towards teaching, then you will have that credibility behind you that is very difficult for any teacher to obtain. That scientific credibility only comes from working as a scientist for a number of years. Of course, another way of gaining communication training is to start your own online communication platforms, starting a YouTube channel, starting your own podcast, but we'll save that topic for another day. That's it for another episode and I hope to connect you again next time around.